I'm John Chinakopoulos, the chair of the Hellenic Studies Department uh, and a professor in economics, and I'd like to welcome you all here. I'm so glad to see so many of you. So glad to see a previous chair, Stathis Kalivas, back from Oxford here to join us for these talks. Uh, these lectures bring to Yale every year, this is the 15th one of them, a uh, distinguished uh, scholar in the humanities or the social sciences or a public figure uh, or an artist or somebody of international reputation. Yanis is all of those. Uh, as you probably know, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation has been the primary sponsor of these lectures uh, since the program had its uh, beginnings. In fact, the Niarchos Foundation founded the Hellenic Studies program as a pilot program in 2001, and then in 2007 it established it as a permanent program. The Niarchos Foundation has therefore created Hellenic Studies at Yale, but that's not all it does. It's worked all over the campus to provide uh, activities in the School of Art, the Peabody Museum, the Center for Globalization, all over Yale. But not just all over Yale, all over the country. So this is the Nearchos Foundation that opened up recently in Athens, a spectacular building that you, many of you have probably been to. This is, uh, in the center here, is the last, the outgoing uh, president of the <coughs> Yale Undergraduate uh, uh, Greek Students Association, Daphne Martin, and she's there with uh, three of her friends, the four of them, uh, from Yale, went to Sparta uh, to, to sponsor, to help sponsor the, the rebuilding of the archaeological museum and to give tours of the, of the current archaeological museum. And I happened to be there at the time, and I read about them in the newspaper, and I rushed over to get a tour, which was quite wonderful, and I brought along my cousin, Answer, who you see on the side here, who, who turned out to be uh, a rap singer, uh, and possibly the second most famous rap singer in, in Greece. But anyway, he's also named John Chinakopoulos. So uh, while I was there, of course, I visited all my relatives in a little town called Theologos. Here are some of them. Here are more of them. Um, so the Nearchos Foundation, it turns out, does a lot in, in, in Sparta because Nearchos himself comes from a town uh, in Laconia called Vambaku. And so, for example, the Nearchos Foundation is, is uh, building a hospital in Sparta designed by Renzo Piano. And, most interesting to me, the foundation decided that there are not enough young people left in these beautiful villages. The, the, the people are aging, and the young people are moving out of the villages, and they're paying now for uh, grade schoolers from Athens to visit Vanvaku during the summer and see what it's like, see what the culture of the villages were like, and also bring a little life and energy to the villages. And here is Vanvaku. You see what a beautiful village it is. And the, the long-term residents are you know, under 20 now. Tiny disappearing village. So of course, Vanvaku is not the only village in the hills above Sparta where the people left are a little bit old. You could imagine Theologos being part of the part of the program shortly. Well, it turns out that uh, Vanvaku is only 30 miles away, 30 kilometers from Theologos, and. Uh, I'm related to the Nyarkos, as I found out this summer. <laughs> so my mom, Answer, who you saw before, his grandfather, my grandfather's nephew, who was Answer's grandfather, married Answer's grandmother, the Sarantopoulos family, who's a second cousin to Stavros and the Arcos. You know, the more I talked to my family and realized we were related to the Arcos, I, I began to realize that actually my family might have been doing better than the Nyarkos. So, uh, it turns out that my grandfather, my grandmother, was the richest girl in Sparta, and this is the house she grew up in in the late 19, uh, in the late 1800s. She was born in the late 1800s. It's now a military uh, center of Sparta, but uh, if you've been to Sparta, you know there are not many houses like that, and that's why where my grandfather lived. So my grandfather left uh, Theologos at the age of. 
12 in 1892 by himself and came to America and built a candy factory. And this is the candy factory on Lake and Hennepin in Minneapolis, the first creek in Minneapolis. And you can see the Gina Coppola's name. There it's blown up a little bit, the Gina Coppola's name. And thank you. Recently, uh, it's been remodeled. <laughs> and it's now part of Calhoun Square. And, and the, the, the singer from Minneapolis, known as Prince, wrote a song about Calhoun Square, my grandfather's candy factory. So I mean, I ask you, you no? Know? <laughs> so, today we're very lucky that the Yarkos lecturer is Yanni Stunaris. He's a man, as I said at the beginning, who's done it all. He combines all the, all the desirable qualities of a Niarco speaker. He's an undergraduate at the University of Athens. He got his master's at Oxford, his PhD at Oxford in economic theory and policy. Uh, he became a lecturer and research fellow at St. Catherine's College in Oxford. Then he came back to Greece and was a special advisor to the Ministry of, Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Greece, a professor at the University of Athens in 1989. I decided I wanted a little more detail about this, so uh, one of my partners in a business I, I run on the side, his sister, um, Vicky Nicopoulos, went to grade school with <laughs> And she said he was quick-witted and very smart, at least between the ages of 11 and 14, uh, when we took a tutorial together in English. And he had curly, reddish-blonde hair. <laughs> So, uh, but Yanis, after that, became chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors from 1994 to 2000, at a crucial time for, for Greece when it joined the EU, so just before joining the European Monetary Union, Union I mean, it, uh, he became president and CEO of Mkodiki Bank, the vice chair of the Association of Greek Bankers, Greek Banks, the Minister of Finance in 2012 to 2014, and the governor of the Bank of Greece. Now, not only does he do all these things, he's also a mesmerizing speaker. When I was there in 2013, I went, I was in Sunyo, and there was a talk in the moonlight at the Temple of Poseidon that Yanis gave, and I was trying to remember the mythological theme that he carried throughout his whole talk. I'm afraid I've forgotten it, but it was a beautiful <laughs> speech. And so, uh, let me say, Again, how glad I am to welcome all of you here to the Niarcos Lectures, and especially how glad I am to welcome Yanni Stunaris, even though this isn't quite the Temple of Poseidon, it's still <laughs> Yale University. Welcome, Yanis. Thank you, thank you, John. I think, uh, if I remember well, I, I must have told you an anecdote um, about uh, Delphi. Um, uh, that, uh, if if I remember well, it was um, because at, at that time, at that time there was a controversy: uh, which university was better, Oxford or Cambridge? So, a, a delegation of both universities they went to Delphi. Uh, to ask the oracle, to ask the oracle. So they ask the oracle. So the oracle, the oracle using all the, you know, the usual stuff. Uh, she took hours and hours, and then at the end, she she turned them and said, uh, "What is Cambridge?" <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's okay. Well, it's a really great honor for me to be invited to deliver the annual Stavros Niarchos Foundation Lecture. The Hellenic Studies program at the Yale Macmillan Center does an excellent job. I had the opportunity to visit some of the, uh, of the rooms here and uh, some, some of the colleagues um, in studying and promoting contemporary Greek culture and history. So in my talk today, I will first present the lessons to be drawn from the Greek crisis. By the way, the title of the speech will be Greece in Europe, Reasons for Optimism. So I will then discuss the progress made in recent years and the outlook for the Greek economy uh, and highlight the crisis legacies and the challenges that lie ahead both for Greece and the Eurozone. Finally, I will put forward some policy proposals for addressing these challenges both for Greece and the 
Euro area. From 2000 to 2007, Greece experienced benign macroeconomic conditions characterized by high rates of GDP growth, well above the Euro area average, relatively stable consumer price inflation, and a gradually decreasing unemployment rate. The expansion was driven mainly by rapid credit growth and low borrowing costs following financial liberalization and Greece's entry into EMU in 2001. The Maastricht criteria for joining economic and monetary union were based solely on nominal convergence and therefore failed to incentivize the structural reforms um, in the product and labor markets and in the functioning of the public sector needed to enhance real convergence, raise potential growth, and safeguard the sustainability of public finances. On the contrary, employer and employee interest groups opposed reforms that would have increased competitiveness. Although Greece's GDP per capita increased during the boom period, approaching the European Union average, the institutional gap relative to the euro area did not narrow. Thus, Greece continued to lag significantly behind uh, its euro area partners in various indicators of governance and structural competitiveness. The sharp deterioration of the fiscal and macroeconomic environment in 2008 and 2009 and the subsequent downgrades of sovereign debt and rising sovereign spreads cut off the Greek sovereign and banks from international capital and money markets. Substantial deposit withdrawals and extremely tight liquidity conditions put strain on the banking sector. An EU IMF financed economic adjustment program was initiated in 2010, aiming to correct these imbalances. The crisis has taken a heavy toll on output, incomes and wealth. Between 2008 and 2016, Greece lost over one-fourth of its GDP at constant prices and the unemployment rate rose by nearly 16 percentage points. Furthermore, GDP per capita at purchasing power parity declined to 67.4 percent of the EU average in 2018, down from 93.3 uh, 90, percent in 2008. To this, one must add the large, high, uh, the large increase of non-performing loans, that is the NPL ratio, to about 50% of the total, the large brain drain and massive underinvestment with their immeasurable economic and social consequences. The slide of the GDP growth rate into negative territory raised the debt to GDP ratio to unsustainable levels despite the fiscal consolidation and caused debt servicing problems for households and businesses. This was the main, but not the exclusive reason, why non-performing loans rose dramatically, weakening banks' asset quality, thus making it difficult for banks to finance the real economy. It took no less than eight years, three economic adjustment programs, major debt restructuring, and three rounds of bank recapitalization to resolve the Greek crisis. The length and depth of the Greek crisis can be explained by seven factors. First, the size and speed of fiscal consolidation were unprecedented. This primarily had to do with the fact that the initial fiscal and external imbalances were much higher in Greece than in other member states under financial stress. In addition, emphasis has on average been placed over the three adjustment programs more on tax hikes rather than on expenditure cuts, growth enhancing reforms and privatizations. Second, the fiscal multipliers turned out to be higher than initially anticipated and the economy was soon caught in a vicious circle of austerity and recession. Third, the second chain of structural reforms led to real wages declining more than initially expected, exacerbating the recession. In other words, the reform effort focused much more on the labor market than on the goods and services markets. Hence, nominal wages declined faster and more strongly than prices. Households experienced a massive drop in purchasing power, which in turn constrained personal consumption and deepened the recession. Fourth, the non-performing loans problem proved very difficult to manage. Mainly the result of economic contraction, it was further exacerbated by legislative changes, such as the blanket moratorium on primary residence auctions and the abuse of foreclosure protection, as well as several other legal and judicial impediments. 
With the benefit of hindsight, it could be said that a more dynamic response during the first years of the crisis, implementing the necessary legislative changes much earlier and introducing a systemic solution by a centralized asset management company for non-performing loans, as other member states had done, could have reduced the problem we face today. Fifth, certain reforms fell behind the agreed time schedule on account of a number of factors, including insufficient ownership of the necessary reforms, populist rhetoric, political rivalry, and the resistance of various vested interests to reform. This had serious consequences. The signing of a third economic adjustment program, the introduction of capital controls, mainly to stem the outflow of bank deposits, another bank recapitalization round, and two years of economic stagnation. Sixth, Political deliberations in the Euro area also played their part in delaying the recovery of the Greek economy. The Eurogroup decision of November 2012 to grant further debt relief was put off for a number of years and was only implemented in June 2018. This undermined the growth prospects of the Greek economy and prolonged the crisis. Had this form of, of debt relief be given at the beginning of the first economic adjustment program, alongside the implementation of ambitious growth enhancing structural reforms and an asset management company to deal with the problem of non-performing loans, it would have had a more positive impact on the economy, possibly limit the out output and employment losses. Seventh, when the Greek crisis broke out, the Economic and Monetary Union lacked the tools to prevent or contain the crisis. The Stability and Growth Pact failed to control the buildup of public debt in the pre-crisis period. There was insufficient monitoring and control over macroeconomic imbalances, such as the evolution of the current account and private debt. The sovereign bank doom loop amplified the financial crisis and the recession. Euro area crisis management and resolution tools were poor or even non-existent on account of highly exaggerated concerns about moral hazard and due to the lack of an appropriate institutional setting. There was no provision for risk sharing in the initial EMU architecture. It was the ECB's response, especially after mid-2012, which provided the time required for euro area governments to take the actions necessary to safeguard the stability of the financial system and strengthen economic and monetary union. <coughs> Despite the missteps, the occasional backsliding and delays, significant progress has been made since the beginning of the sovereign debt crisis in 2010. The implementation of economic adjustment programs has eliminated the root causes of the Greek crisis. More specifically, the achieved fiscal adjustment was unprecedented, turning a primary deficit of 10% of GDP in 2009 into a primary surplus of 4.3% of GDP in 2018. The primary surplus in 2018 exceeded the program target for the four year in a row. The current account deficit has been reduced by 12 percentage points of GDP since the beginning of the crisis. Labor cost competitiveness has been fully restored and price competitiveness has recorded substantial gains since 2009. A bold program of structural reforms was implemented, covering such areas as the pension and healthcare systems, goods and services markets, the business environment, the tax system, the budgetary framework, and public sector transparency. <coughs> the banking system has been restructured. Today, only four systemic banks control, control over 95% of the market, as more than 10 other banks were merged or liquidated. The role of the Bank of Greece was pivotal in the restructuring and recapitalization of the banking system, the enhancement of its corporate governance, and the provision of liquidity all over Greece, especially during the crisis years. Today, banks' capital adequacy ratios stand at rather satisfactory levels, and their loan loss provisions are sufficient to address potential credit risks. A number of important reforms have been implemented aiming to provide banks with an array of tools for tackling the problem of non-performing loans, including a strengthening of the supervisory framework by setting operational targets for non-performing loan reduction, the creation of a secondary non-performing loan market, and the removal of various legal, judicial, and administrative barriers to the management of non-performing loans. These actions have started to bear fruit, 
as shown by the continuous reduction of the non-performing loan stock in line with the target set. Non-performing loans amounted to 75.4 billion euros at the end of June 2019, down by almost 32 billion from their peak in March 2016. However, the NPL ratio remains high at 43.6% in June 2019. As a result of the reforms implemented since the beginning of the crisis and the effort of enterprises to make up for declining domestic demand by exporting to new markets, openness has increased substantially and the economy has started to rebalance towards tradable, export-oriented sectors. The share of total exports in GDP increased from 19% in 2009 to 36% in 2018. Exports of goods and services, excluding the shipping sector, have increased in real terms by 60% since the trough in 2009, outperforming euro area exports as a whole. The volume of tradable goods and services in the economy increased cumulatively between 2010 and 2017 by approximately 14% relative to non-tradables in terms of gross value added. Following the stagnation of 2015 and 2016, GDP growth returned to positive territory in 2017, where it grew by 1.5% and picked up to 1.9% in 2018. Recent real GDP data point to continued expansion in the second quarter of 2019, which, which about 1.9% year on year. Thanks to the improved economic conditions and the reforms implemented since 2010, the unemployment rate, though still high, fell to 16.9% in the second quarter of 2019, from 27.8% at the end of 2013. Looking forward, the Bank of Greece expects that economic activity will remain on a positive growth uh, trajectory, expanding by 1.9% for the whole year of 2019, that is by 2.3% year on year in the second semester of the current year and above 2% next year in 2020. The outlook is of course subject to downside risks related both to the external but also the domestic environment. The global growth and trade slowdown due to imminent trade war could affect export growth more markedly while the disorderly Brexit, geopolitical tensions and the recent increase in oil prices are further significant downside risks. A possible sharp correction in global capital and financial markets could increase the cost and reduce the availability of funding, particularly for the private sector. There are also downside risks on the fiscal front associated with ongoing court rulings on pension cuts, which could weigh on debt sustainability. In addition, an exacerbation of the refugee crisis could hurt tourism. However, there are also domestic opportunities relating to a rapid implementation of structural reforms in Greece and the reduction, both direct and indirect, of the primary surplus uh, fiscal targets. The fact that Greece still lags behind its peers and competitors in almost all indices of structural competitiveness is a huge opportunity for a rapid catch-up which should be exploited. Despite the progress made so far, major short and medium to long-term challenges and crisis-related legacies remain. The main medium to long-term challenges are the following. The high public debt, whose sustainability, of course, improved significantly in the medium term with the measures adopted by the Eurogroup from 2012-2018, creates uncertainty about Greece's ability to service its debt in the long term. In the medium term, there is no problem. I mean, over the, ten, the next 10, 10 years, we have no um, debt servicing problems. Raising the cost of borrowing both for the public and the private sector and hammering growth prospects. Greece's negative current account balance and large negative net international investment uh, position. The high long-term unemployment rate, which generates inequalities threatening social cohesion and increases the risk of human capital erosion. The projected demographic decline due to population aging, but also outward migration, which exerts downward pressure on potential growth and puts at risk the long-term sustainability of the pension system. The slow digital transformation of the economy, 
based on the Digital Economy and Society Index of the European Commission, Greece for the year 2019 ranks 26th among the 28 EU countries, which implies a high risk of technological lag and digital illiteracy. The multi-year recession has left an investment gap and risks permanently impairing the productive capacity of the Greek economy through a hysteresis effect. In more detail, gross fixed capital formation at current prices fell from 26% of GDP in 2007, that is before the crisis, to 11.1% of GDP in 2018. The largest proportion of this decline, that is 10 out of 15 percentage points, is due to shrinking residential investment, which fell from 10.8% of GDP in 2007 to 0.7% of GDP in 2018. Fixed capital investment, net of depreciation, has been negative since 2011. Specifically, in 2018, net fixed capital investment amounted to roughly minus 8.8 .8 billion, or minus 4.8% of nominal GDP. Positive net investment is a prerequisite if the capital stock and thus the potential output of the Greek economy are to increase. Estimates by the Bank of Greece indicate that the net capital stock of the Greek economy at constant 2010 prices declined by 67.4 billion euros in the period 2010-2016 to 622.2 billion euros in 2016. In order to raise the net capital stock over the next decade to peak crisis levels, gross fixed capital formation at constant prices needs to increase by about 10% a year per year. However, excluding residential investment, which accounts for about 50% of the capital stock, gross fixed capital formation at constant prices needs to increase by about 5% per year by 2029, that is for the next uh, decade. Although a business investment growth rate of 5% per year over the next decade is rather high, it is deemed achievable for the Greek economy based on historical experience, so long as suitable investment and business-friendly policies are pursued. Investments needed to accelerate in order to bridge the investment gap in a timely manner and avoid the so-called hysteresis effect. As recently pointed out by the European Commission, Greece needs additional public and private investment in, in transport, solid waste and industrial sewage uh, treatment, water supply, infrastructure and energy network uh, connectivity, mainly between the islands and mainland Greece, in information and communication technology, ICT, and in innovation, education and training. Many of the above investments would align Greece's environmental protection standards with those of the rest of the European Union, something particularly important given the risks of climatic change. Addressing the challenges of climate change calls for coordinated efforts. Incidentally, the Bank of Greece has been playing an active role in this area through its Climate Change Impact Study Committee and its various publications on the topic. Moreover, the Bank of Greece participates in the Central Banks and Supervisors Network for Greening the Financial System, aiming to enhance the role of the financial system in managing climate and environmental risks, analyze the macro-financial impact of climate change, and strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change. Apart from the medium to long-term challenges, the Greek economy also faces major challenges in the immediate future, which need to be dealt with as a matter of urgency. Greek government bonds have yet to regain investment-grade status, despite the substantial decline in their yields after the new government took office and the recent successful issuance of a new seven-year Greek government bond at a yield of 1.9%, with significant participation from foreign institutional investors. Recently, 10-year government bond yields fell below 1.4%, and what is even more important, the corresponding spread fell below 200 basis points, most fell below 190 basis points uh, today. It is estimated that investment grade status could cut further the spread by 60 basis points. The Greek economy continues to face very tight fiscal and monetary conditions compared to all the other member states of the euro area, which negatively affect its growth prospects and overall competitiveness. 
Primer surpluses in recent years have been very large. The high primer surplus targets and their systematic overachievement in recent years through the curtailment of public investment, spending and high taxes have dampened the growth dynamics of the economy, reduced the competitiveness of Greek businesses, created a disincentive to work and invest and caused tax fatigue, leading to a contraction of the tax base and an exhaustion of tax paying, tax paying capacity. The monetary policy easing by the ECB has indirectly benefited Greek businesses and households, but not to the extent that it would have if Greek government bonds had been eligible for the asset purchase program, the APP. It is not eligible because we, are, we don't have still investment grade or we don't have a precautionary credit line. The fact that all the other member states enjoy much more favorable financing conditions for their businesses has an indirect negative impact on Greece's overall competitiveness. The high stock of non-performing loans impairs banks' lending capacity and increases lending costs. This is yet another reason, on top of the previous one just mentioned, why Greek businesses continue to face higher financing costs than their European counterparts, which undermine their competitive position, despite the significant drop in unit labor costs, following the wide range of reforms that were implemented in recent years. It is indicative that according to the most recently available data, the average bank lending rate for businesses in Greece is still slightly below 5%, compared to slightly above 2% in the euro area. Up to now, the business environment had not been considered investment friendly and in fact discouraged investment. Non-price competitiveness, so-called structural competitiveness, is very low compared to Greece's EU partners. This is mainly due to high tax rates, weak public sector efficiency and delays in court proceedings and rulings. Here are some numbers. According to the World Economic Forum in October 2018, Greece ranked um, 103rd out of 140 countries in checks and balances, which refers to budget transparency, judicial independence, efficiency of legal framework in challenging regulations and freedom of the press, 115th in public sector performance, which refers to the burden of government regulation, efficiency of legal framework in setting disputes, e-participation index, future orientation of government. 119th in property rights protection, which refers to property rights, intellectual property protection and quality of land administration. And 119th again, as regards the strength of auditing and reporting standards. According to the World Bank's Doing Business Report for 2019, Greece ranks 132nd out of 190 countries in terms of enforcing contracts. Specifically, it takes 1,580 days for a case to be heard by the competent court of first instance and for the ruling to be enforced compared to only 582 days in the OECD high-income economies. Resolving insolvency takes 3.5 years compared to 1.7 years in the OECD high-income economies. Thus, the recovery rate is 30. 33.2% uh, in Greece against 70% in the OECD high income economies. The reformist agenda of the new Greek government elected uh, last, last July is viewed positively by the international financial markets as indicated by the rapid declining in uh, Greek government bond yields which, as already said, currently stand at below 1.4%. The government is swiftly implementing its planned investment and growth friendly policies, which involve lowering business taxes and placing more emphasis on reforms and privatizations as a means to address short and long term challenges and reinforce the credibility of economic policy. Meanwhile, the substantial improvement in budget execution, according to recently published Bank of Greece CAS data between end June and end August 2019, indicate that the primary surplus fiscal target for 2019. Uh, 19 will be met. This should support the efforts of the Greek government to achieve an upgrade of investment bonds to investment grade status by international credit rating organizations. Should this happen, Greek bonds would then be allowed to participate in ECB's recently enhanced asset purchase program and therefore 
to reap substantial benefits in terms of lower borrowing costs for, for the Greek economy. If you remember, I said that this will add, this, this will cut uh, about 60 basis points for our borrowing costs on average. To this end, economic policy should follow a three-pronged approach aimed at, first, achieving the agreed fiscal targets, second, drastically reducing non-performing loans, and third, stepping up the pace of structural reforms and privatizations. The fact that the new government immediately announced that it will respect the agreed fiscal targets is a welcome development. At the same time, in line with what the Bank of Greece has repeatedly stressed in recent years, the government is negotiating both direct and indirect of the primary surplus target um, with the institutions. A lower, more realistic primary surplus target compared to the current one of 3.5% of GDP through 2022, if combined with more reforms and privatizations, would probably imply lower that, rather than higher uh, public debt. This is so because with a public debt to GDP ratio of 180% of GDP, a one percentage point higher growth rate, which is likely to materialize if the lower primary surplus target is achieved through lower taxes and social contributions, combined with more privatization and structural reforms, and or 100 basis points lower borrowing costs, which is already materialized relative to the European Commission's baseline scenario, for those of you that you don't remember, the baseline scenario of the European Commission assumes an average 10-year uh, bond interest rate of 4.9%, while now it is less than 1.4%. So that's a very big difference. So this is 1.8 times more effective in reducing the debt, the debt ratio rather than an additional GDP percentage points of a primary surplus. The fact that Government borrowing costs today are much lower than under the baseline scenario in the European Commission's debt sustainability analysis, provides leeway for easing the fiscal targets without compromising debt sustainability. Moreover, the Stability and Growth Pact allows for fiscal flexibility so long as additional reforms increase potential growth. In a nutshell, there appear to be sufficient ground for lowering the primary surplus targets and ample room for a compromise solution. In such a solution, primary surpluses could be lowered in exchange for an acceleration of reforms. The outcome will be a win-win situation both for Greece and for its EU partners, given that Greece will be able to return faster to a high growth path that safeguards fiscal sustainability and the repayment of bailout funds. Downside risks related to external factors also justify a reduction of the primary surplus fiscal target. Priority must continue to be given to reducing the high stock of non-performing loans, which impairs bank profitability and lending capacity and delays the recovery of investment and economic activity. As I mentioned before, the ratio of NPLs to total loans remains very high, 43.6% in June 2019. According to operational targets for NPL reduction, the aim is to bring the NPL ratio down to 35% by end 2019 and to below 20% by end 2021. Overall, despite the progress in this regard, the pace of NPL reduction has not been fast enough to bring the Greek NPL ratio close to the European average of 3.1% as of March 2019. The activation of a truly systemic solution to the NPL reduction, which resembles an asset management company, would, alongside the bank's own efforts, be key for cleaning up the balance sheets of banks, for bank lending to increase and for investment to recover. After all, similar solutions have been implemented in almost all member states under financial stress. Foreign direct investment is also necessary as domestic savings are insufficient to match the investment needed for high growth rates. If Greece is to attract foreign direct investment, it must speed up privatizations, which mobilize additional private investment, promote private-public partnerships in various sectors, and focus on removing major disincentives, such as red tape, the lack of a clear and stable legislative and regulatory framework 
an unpredictable tax system, weaknesses in property rights protection, limited access to financing and high borrowing costs, and delays in legal dispute resolution. The lifting of capital controls on September 1st is an important step towards attracting foreign uh, direct investment. In addition to helping reduce the investment gap, foreign direct investment promotes closer trade links with countries and companies with state-of-the-art technologies and facilitates participation in global value chains. This would increase openness and improve both the quantity and quality of, of Greek exportable products. <coughs> Greater emphasis must also, must also be placed on improving public sector efficiency through the modernization and digitalization of public administration and state-owned enterprises with a redesigning of procedures and responsibilities and the evaluation and development of, of staff capacities and infrastructures. Legal certainty and clarity and the stable legal framework, as well as the speedy and reliable resolution of legal disputes, would be fundamental to strengthening the rule of law, improving the investment climate and accelerating economic growth. Moreover, international experience has shown that robust economic growth is achieved especially by countries with good governance and strong independent institutions. Finally, it is necessary to strengthen the knowledge triangle, that is education, research and innovation, through policies and reforms that promote research, technology diffusion, entrepreneurship, and foster closer ties between businesses, research centers and universities. Strengthening the knowledge triangle and uh, information and communication technologies would lead to the digital transformation of the economy an increase in the stock of knowledge and productive capital, the development of outward-oriented sectors, and more generally, to a knowledge economy and society. Ladies and gentlemen, Greece belongs to the euro area and is directly affected by its economic and financial conditions. Hence, Greece has a very strong interest in promoting and supporting policies that strengthen the euro area economy. Policy makers around the world have learned their lessons from the Great Depression. A financial system in distress requires active central bank intervention. Thus, when the need arose and in the absence of an appropriate policy response by governments, the European Central Bank stepped in decisively to restore market confidence, contain the sovereign debt crisis and support the euro area economy by safeguarding price and financial stability. The European Central Bank used the asset side of its balance sheet, as well as other tools such as forward guidance, in addition to its standard and non-standard interest rate policies. Given the success of these policies, some of these instruments will be permanently included in the new standard framework, as the effective lower bound will likely continue to be a binding constraint on interest rate policy in a low inflation, low interest rate environment. Indeed, earlier this month, following subdued inflation, a downward revision of inflation forecasts and weakening euro area growth, the governing council of the ECB decided to adopt an even more accommodative monetary policy with an even lower deposit facility rate, a new asset purchase program, more favorable terms for TLTRO3, and the new forward guidance. Euro-area governments took a number of necessary actions to safeguard the stability of the financial system and to strengthen EMU after the, the Greek crisis. Policy actions have focused on addressing institutional weaknesses, structural fragilities and excessive risk-taking that led to the sovereign debt crisis and the negative feedback loop between sovereigns and banks which in turn undermined euro area stability. Other steps taken involved not only more effective regulation, but also higher capital and liquidity buffers for banks, early warning systems and the development of macroprudential tools to increase resilience to potential shocks. The eruption of the Greek crisis, as well as the crisis in other member states, acted as a catalyst for key initiatives, such as the provision of intergovernmental loans to Greece, 
the establishment of the European Financial Stability Facility and its successor, the European Stability Mechanism. Other initiatives, which stemmed mainly from the world banking crisis, included the creation of the banking union with a single supervisory mechanism, the single resolution mechanism, and the yet to be created European Deposit Insurance Scheme. The introduction of stricter rules on banking regulation and supervision, as well as the establishment of the European Systemic Risk Board. Finally, the European Commission proceeded with the development of a more appropriate macroprudential, macroprudential tools, which allowed for greater emphasis on identifying and addressing system-wide risks, the strengthening of the Stability and Growth Pact, the initiation of the macroeconomic imbalances procedure, and the European semester. As a result of the, of the above initiatives, all member states that had received European Union and IMF assistance are now back on their feet. Macroeconomic imbalances have been corrected to a large extent and growth has been fostered. Economic expansion in the Euro area as a whole continues, albeit at a slower pace, and EU banks have become more resilient to financial shocks over the past two years, as reflected in the results of the European Union-wide stress tests. Moreover, four additional member states were admitted to EMU during the crisis years. However, despite the progress achieved so far, the Euro area faces several challenges ahead. The recovery of the Euro area from the financial crisis lags behind the recovery of its global competitors. This reflects weak productivity performance and the lagging behind in innovation and digital technologies. Population aging and climate change raise serious concerns about the long-term outlook for the Euro area economy. Post-crisis, we have seen a halt in financial integration which weakens private risk sharing in the Euro area. According to a recent IMF discussion note, and in accordance to what has been said before, businesses in Greece pay a 2.5% higher rate of interest of their financial debt than similar businesses in the same industry in France, for instance. Moreover, for every one percentage point drop, in national GDP growth, consumption drops by 0.75 percentage points on average in the Euro area, compared to only 0.18 percentage points on average in the United States. Economic convergence in terms of real GDP per capita among the 12 old Euro area countries has stopped since 2010. This continues uh, to hold true even if you keep Greece out because of the crisis. Only the new Euro area member states have showed substantial convergence. Divergence has widened also in terms of unemployment rate and income inequality indicators. So, bold steps need to be taken to strengthen the Euro area. In the financial sector, it is a priority to complete the banking union by creating the European Deposit Insurance Scheme. The banking union will help to create a better integrated, more efficient and well-capitalized European banking sector. Coupled with the completion of the Capital Markets Union, a single rulebook for banks and capital markets, converges in taxation frameworks, in capital market supervision, in insolvency procedures, and with European Union rules allowing pension funds and insurance companies to participate in long-term market investments, it can be expected to support the single market and to fund investment and growth. More developed and integrated capital and banking markets will reduce funding costs, improve the, financing, improve the financing of the real economy by diversifying the sources of financing and facilitate private risk sharing through the capital and credit channels. For example, as recently flagged by the IMF, if Greece were to improve its insolvency practices to best-in-class standards, it could reduce its business average debt fun funding cost by about 50 basis points. More developed and integrated capital and banking markets will also support the international role of the euro through the creation of more integrated and liquid capital markets. However, we need to make sure that the expansion of the non-banking sector does not endanger financial stability. Increased risk sharing is highly desirable, but we should not forget 
that greater public risk sharing is only possible with less, not more, sovereignty. Risk sharing, whether in the form of a safe asset, a central fiscal stabilization tool, a fund to ensure against unemployment, or a truly European deposit insurance scheme, should proceed simultaneously with risk reduction, such as the reduction of non-performing loans or national discretions in supervisory and resolution rules for, for banks. It is only in this way that we can transform what is in effect today in the euro area a non-cooperative zero-sum game into a cooperative win-win game. In addition, in a monetary union such as the euro area, the adjustment of current account imbalances should be as symmetric as possible. Not only member states with excessive current account deficits, but also members with excessive current account surpluses should adjust. Monetary policy alone cannot stabilize the economy. Fiscal policy should also be active in those member states where fiscal space exists and public debt remains sustainable. In particular, the euro area urgently needs investment in new technologies in order to catch up with its competitors and investment necessary to face the challenges of climate change. Part of this investment will be public or in the form of private-public partnerships. Moreover, Euro area member states needed to step up structural reform efforts in the labour and product markets to make them more flexible, which is necessary in a single currency area, and boost productivity and to make public finances more robust. However, and learning from the Greek crisis, the sequencing of domestic structural policies is very important. For instance, good and services market flexibility is best achieved before or simultaneously with labour market flexibility. Otherwise, large real wage reductions might occur, which are unnecessary and undesirable, both from an economic and a social perspective. In the context of economic policy coordination and with a view to fostering real convergence, improvements should be made in institutional quality and good governance across Euro area member states. So, to conclude, despite some missteps and delays in the implementation of the required reforms, Greece has made notable progress since the start of the crisis in 2010. The implementation of economic adjustment programs has eliminated several macroeconomic imbalances. The economy is now recovering and has started to rebalance towards the tradable export-oriented sectors. The Bank of Greece expects that economic activity will remain on a positive growth trajectory, expanding by 1.9% in 2019, as I said before, that is by 2.3% year-on-year in the second semester of 2019, and above 2% 2 in 2020. The catching up effect from a long depression is projected to counterbalance the negative effect of a serious global slowdown. However, significant challenges and crisis related legacies remain, that is a high public debt ratio, a high NPL ratio, and high long-term unemployment, while the brain drain and underinvestment weigh heavily on the long-term growth uh, potential. In order to contain future risks and address the remaining challenges and crisis legacies, the government should implement its reform agenda as soon as possible, because there, there, there are clouds in the international horizon. Moreover, the continuation of reforms is an obligation to which Greece is bound in the context of enhanced surveillance, as well as a precondition for the activation of the medium-term debt relief measures. Increased policy credibility through the implementation of reforms, the speeding up of privatizations and unblocking already approved investment plans like the Elinico will increase market confidence in the growth prospects for, for the Greek economy. An acceleration of non-performing loan reduction through the adoption of a truly systemic solution will improve financial conditions for businesses and households, as well as market confidence, and will accelerate investment and GDP growth. The conditions described above will facilitate Greek government bonds regaining investment-grade status, thus paving the way to the inclusion of Greek bonds in the ECB's recently enhanced asset purchase program. This, in turn, would further lower borrowing costs for the Greek economy, thereby boosting growth and improving debt sustainability. 
So in such a benign scenario, growth rates higher than currently projected, above 3%, could be achieved through increased investment. This is possible because the output gap in Greece will remain negative for a number of years. Last but not least, in order to enhance real convergence and strengthen the international role of the Euro, we must take steps to deepen economic and monetary union. The only realistic way forward is to simultaneously promote risk sharing and risk reduction measures to improve policy coordination and to make sure that economic rebalancing operates symmetrically. I am optimistic that Greece, despite occasional failures and backtracking, having survived an acute and long economic crisis once more in its history, and contrary to almost all pessimistic forecasts, has now a great opportunity to close the institutional, investment and structural competitiveness gap with its peers and competitors and catch up fast. My optimism, my optimism is not only based on technocratic arguments, but also on historical ones. Please allow me to conclude my speech by quoting the historian Roderick Beaton in his great book, Greece, a Biography of a Modern Nation. This is actually the last paragraph of the book that I'm going to quote. 200 years ago, during the 1820s, Greeks were the pioneers who first mapped out the route that would lead from the old Europe of great empires to the Europe of nation states that we know today. No one should take it for granted that Greece and Greeks in future will always align with the values, traditions and politics that we tend to love together and call Western. Geography and to some extent also history may pull the other way, but as they prepare to celebrate the 200th birthday of the Greek nation state in 2021, Greeks can take pride in an achievement that by its very nature and from the very beginning has been won not through isolation but in partnership every difficult step of the way with other Europeans. It could not be otherwise because Greece however understood or misunderstood, has always been part of the modern identity of Europe too. Thank you. You mean um, with, with the reforms that, that uh, have occurred? Well, or in the future? Well, already um, during the, the crisis, we have made the economy more, more flexible, um, labor market flexibility, less product market and services flexibility. We have improved uh, the workings of the, of the tax system. Um, Greeks now pay taxes, although still tax evasion. Ah, sorry, you said about climate change only. Yes, what effects might climate change have? The, the, the effects uh, of the climate change, which you can see uh, if you uh, visit the site of the Bank of Greece, uh, we have a very large study. Um, Greece, being a Mediterranean country, uh, will face uh, serious, serious problems in the agricultural sector and in the, in the tourist sector. That's why... Um, sorry. This is why we need to invest heavily heavily in, uh, in, in climatic change. But um, acting alone is not a solution. Uh, we, need, we need a much more coordinated solution, as you know. Uh, so uh, certain large countries staying out doesn't, doesn't help. And uh, the, the problem is very acute. And uh, it, uh, it might already um, have started to, to, to create serious serious consequences. I mean, the melting of uh, ice in the Antarctic um, has, has started already, I'm afraid. So we should have started yesterday.
on the question of non-performing non loans in banks. You mentioned it many times. 43% of loans outstanding are not performing. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately. Isn't that, isn't that the definition of a bank that is dead on arrival? I mean, it's, it's uh, a zombie. Uh, in the United States, I think, Savings and Loan Association crisis, in which savings and loan associations had terrific amounts of non-performing loans. Those had to be wiped away in order for the economy <coughs> to get over the crisis. And perhaps Professor Jean Topolis can comment on, respond to what I'm saying. Yes, um, it is true. This, this is um, the, the main legacy of the crisis. Um, it doesn't have to do with, uh, um, um, uh, with uh, problems of the banking system. It, it has to do with the sovereign debt, debt crisis, which has impacted on banks. Um, the fact is that uh, in nominal terms, um, non-performing loans has uh, uh, the, the, num the, the, the value, the nominal value of non-performing loans has fallen significantly from more than 100 billion to uh, about 73 billion today. But the problem is that the ratio remains high because if you reduce, if, if you sell NPLs, for instance, if you securitize NPLs, you reduce the numerator, but you, re you, re you reduce the denominator as well. That's why um, we have come, in the Bank of Greece, we have come, come out to the conclusion that along with the strong efforts uh, by the banks, we also need a systemic solution in the form of an asset management company. I mean, the Bank of Greece uh, has worked out a solution. Um, the government is about uh, to adopt a solution now, um, which, is, which of course is not a systemic one, but it helps. Uh, it, it will hopefully be approved by uh, the DGCOM in, in, uh, in the European Commission in the next few weeks. And then uh, it will sub submit for approval the Bank of Greece plan. So these are the, the solutions that I to talk about that need to be implemented alongside the, the efforts of the banks. Because despite these efforts, the problem is so large as you described that despite the reduction in the next three to, to, four, to four years, the distance between Greece and the uh, European peers in terms of the ratios will remain very high. This is why we need, uh, we need a systemic solution, not only the individual efforts of banks. I mean, after all, uh, many um, financially distressed member states have made use of this uh, solution, like uh, Ireland, for instance, or, or, or Spain, um, or, or even uh, Cyprus. Um, John, can I interrupt you and yeah. the microphone? Yeah, we, we really need the more. Because um, your question will not be videotaped, and our speaker may not actually hear it clearly. So yes. we have a microphone for the audience. We need several microphones, I think. But anyway, we have one. So I think many of you may have had the same experience I did visiting Greece a couple years ago. You could barely take, of course, as a foreigner, it was okay, but the, the local people couldn't take money out of the banks more than a few, you know, uh, euros a week because there were capital controls because everyone who was able up until the point had moved their money outside. The banks had not 43%, but 50% non-performing loans. All over the world, people were worried and even expecting that the banking system was going to completely collapse. There you were, head of the Bank of Greece, head of a system on the verge of collapse. And now it seems much better. What did you do? What happened? How did it get better? It seemed so bad just two years ago or three years ago. How did you solve the problem? How did Greece solve the problem? I think the main, uh, the, the catalyst was the return of confidence. Um, so. We stemmed the outflow of deposits. We recapitalized banks. We consolidated the banking system. As I said, now we have only four systemic banks and a number of smaller non-systemic ones. Uh, we used to have more, more than, 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 than 20 before the crisis. So uh, Confidence in what? You restored confidence in what? 
conf confidence in the in the financial system, I think, and the uh, and the fiscal system, both. I think that that's extremely important. But how? So, what made people think things were going to get better instead of worse? That, that, um, what was the, the magic the, that you created? The the fact that uh, um, both government and oppositions um, finally discovered that there was no other way out uh, but uh, follow the the orthodox way of reducing um, fiscal imbalances and doing structural reforms. So when this happened, um, things started working uh, more properly than before. Okay. More questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would like to stay a bit on the NPLs. Uh, I have a question. So we understand the importance of uh, disposing these uh, non-performing loans. My question is, uh, when this is done, will this affect the balance sheet of, uh, of the banks, I mean the question is who will take the loss, the hit? That is, uh, provisions are already taken and uh, Sorry, I can't, I can't, uh, provisions uh, for these yes. bad debts are already taken is the question, or if not, who would take the hit after these NPLs are sold and if this will re be reflected on the balance sheet and if these banks will continue to meet these capital adequacy rules, etc. Okay, um, well, uh, provisions are about 50% uh, um, of the NPLs and another 50% is the value of the collateral. So actually the, 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 the so-called Texas ratio uh, is, about, uh, is about right. So the question is of how to, liquid, to, to liquidate the collateral um, to, to help banks um, solve their problem. Um, the, uh, the capital adequacy ratio is about the, the, European, the, the European Union average. So we're not short in terms of, uh, in terms of tier one capital. Um, the, uh, the, the, the main problem remains the, um, the, the, the high ratio of NPLs. So that's I the mean, when these are sold, it will be... When the problem will be solved? No, when the NPLs are sold, with the hedge funds, with the management company, will this affect the balance sheet of the current banks? or this has already been taken provision of, or it will be shown badly on the balance sheet and st income statements of the banks. Will their financial position be uh, worsened after these NPLs are sold? That's, that's the question. Well, the, the, the balance sheet will improve a lot if you, if you, um, um, if you reduce the number of the, the, the value of NPLs. Uh, it, it will be a mu much better quality of the balance sheet. Of the banks, but also let me let me tell you one 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 small example. Now banks um, set aside two percent every year uh, of the value of their loans for for provisions, so they reduce profits. So profitability has been affected um, dramatically by this two percent reduction every year. Um, for this, this 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 is the, the the cost of credit risk. So imagine what will happen. Um, when this will converge to the European Union average, which is about 0.2, 0 0.3%. So the profitability of the banks will increase. You can generate capital from higher profitability, and so you can, you can, you can start, you, you can stop deleveraging and start um, net lending growth again. Of course, gross, gross lending has, has started, but net lending remains still still negative because of the high NPL problem. I just want to put her question a different way. Um, the, it used to, very often in these kinds of crises, the, the banks can pretend that their loans are worth more than they really are, and it's only when they're forced to actually sell them as the Greek government and the, you are forcing the banks to sell them. So one might have expected that when they got sold, it would be revealed that they really were worth much less than the banks were saying. But it seems not to be the case. It seems for the, f not very many have been sold, but they seem to be getting sold at more or less the level that they were marked at. Is that true? That's her question. Is that true? That they have been sold at the level they were valued? No, they are, they, they are sold at market prices. Still, market prices are lower than, than, than the initial values. 
Not uh, the initial values, but the, the initial values. values. But, but market prices improve now. And also the collateral improves because of the um, higher value of real estate. Yeah. So uh, this is extremely important. Yeah, so, so this bank confidence benefits, that's bank been benefits. restored in the whole economy is helping everything. The, Absolutely. The collateral prices are going up, the NPL values are going up, and uh, but that that's was exactly, the miracle that happened in the last two years. John, this is exactly why um, we try to convince our peers and uh, our peers and partners that it is imperative uh, to allow us a lower fiscal target in order to, Im to, improve, to improve the growth rate. Because the, the growth rate is like a global factor, as we say, which will, will, um, will improve everything. Um, the bank's balance sheet, um, the balance sheet of households and companies. So this is um, really the, uh, the catalytic force. Trying to keep track of the question. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned bank capital, um, but in fact, a lot of bank capital is funny money capital. It's not the real capital. It's deferred tax credits. And so I, I was wondering if you could tell us what is the expected, um, the, what are the projections for the effectively elimination of this uh, funny money capital? And um, moving to targets which are uh, real money capital, which will uh, provide the true buffer for, for future losses. And which, by the way, the funny money capital makes, in fact, your, the, the urgency of your proposal uh, even more uh, uh, acute. And if you, uh, if you don't mind also, uh, tell us, uh, in particular, if you can, about public power corporation loans, which, uh, if not handled properly, will revert to non-performing. Uh, for the Greek banks. The exposure is mostly Greek, Greek banks and European Investment Bank, as I understand, with guarantee to the Hellenic Republic, which also may have some uh, effect. Uh, so uh, I'd like to know how, uh, what steps are being taken to ensure that these loans will not um, be reclassified. Well, um, for those of you that uh, you're not specialists, uh, um, Mr. Emanuelidis refers um, uh, capital in the form of uh, deferred tax claim. Um, which, is, uh, which is a claim, uh, which is a claim of the banks towards the state. Why this claim um, has, been, has been created? Because when the PSI uh, happened, um, banks um, had, had damages, losses, um, which created tax claims. Those future tax claims, uh, they are called deferred tax claims. Um, so now, when a bank um, has profits, doesn't pay taxes. If a bank has losses, then uh, the state will intervene uh, with, with a capital increase. This is uh, uh, very, very shortly the, the, the definition of the deferred tax claim. For, for the regulator, the deferred tax claim is a perfect form of capital. We do not consider it as a lower quality capital. Uh, it's a claim on the state, and the state will honor uh, this claim. Of course, we understand that uh, credit rating organizations don't like, uh, they, 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 they don't like this form of capital, and this is why the proposal of the Bank of Greece tries at one stroke to solve both problems, the NPL problem and the DTC problem. So, uh, that's why when I, uh, I refer to a systemic solution, I mostly refer to the, to the proposal of the Bank of Greece, which solves at least half of the NPL problem and at least half of the uh, form of capital that, that you mentioned, the, the DTC. Now, um, hopefully, <coughs> when the, uh, the uh, the so-called uh, asset protection scheme is being approved by the European Commission. Um, the Greek banks will, will make use of this, which is a positive step in the right direction, but it is not enough in my view. Um, we, we need a much more systemic solution um, in the form of the Bank of Greece proposal. Um, now, the PPC. The PPC is a, is a serious problem, but it has a solution. If you um, think what happened to the PPC over the, the, the previous years. It was a company where um, it could not raise taxes, a company that, uh, sorry, it could not raise tariffs, a company that it could, net, it, it could not collect debt, 
a company that a company that it could not privatize its assets. So uh, the government will make use of uh, certain of these instruments uh, to put the company back into uh, into sustainability. So it, it does need uh, to write off debt. Okay, uh, it simply needs to do um, what a uh, I would say a a, a rational government. Uh, should do on a, on, in a, for, for a state electricity company that uh, uh, has, has, been done all, uh, has been done all over the world. Back to the FU with the glasses and the suit. So thank you for your remarks, uh, Governor Strenares. Um, Germany, uh, Greece's largest trading uh, counterparty, uh, is teetering on the verge of uh, recession by all uh, ma uh, market-related uh, metrics, at least the ones that are looking forward. So what or how Greece's recovery economic recovery efforts may be impacted by a possible a slip into a deeper a recession by Germany. And a, a, a secondary question, uh, I heard... Let's stick to one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, yes, you, you're right. Uh, Germany had two quarters of negative growth, so technically is, is in a recession. Um, the reasons uh, have to do uh, with the uh, imminent trade, trade, trade war, which has affected uh, Germany's exports to China in particular. Uh, but also there are some specific uh, factors uh, related um, to the uh, um, car industry in Germany. Um, so it might or might not continue. It, had an it, it, it has an impact uh, on Greek exports, although not, not a serious one. I mean, uh, the, um, the export growth that um, we, we experienced in, uh, in previous months show, show, um, shows that, um, that it is resilient despite the recession in Germany. Um, but the solution must come from an activation of fiscal policy in Germany. Germany has a huge fiscal space. Germany has a huge current account space. It's not reasonable not to use these spaces. It can borrow, uh, the, the German state can borrow at negative interest rates. So it can build its infrastructure uh, by subsidizing, by, by uh, ha having a, a subsidy from the, from the financial markets, not a cost. So this is why we strongly urge Germany uh, to, to take action and, uh, and expand its uh, Infrastructure and public investment. Would they listen? <laughs> Would they listen? Uh, I think, I think uh, they are they are listening, and uh, if I'm correct, uh, they will start spending on uh, on climatic change. I think this this, this will be the f the first public investment in Germany. They could invest in green infrastructure. That, <laughs> that's yes. Okay. Okay, so well, this is not, I mean, Germany can either directly uh, participate in, um, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Greek investment projects, uh, for instance, in, in the energy sector, or through, they can do it indirectly uh, through the uh, European Investment Bank uh, by enhancing the, the capital of the European Investment Bank and the European Investment uh, Bank can take action and invest in Greece or in the rest of the European South. So there are many, many ways that Germany can, can uh, say, contribute to uh, the recovery of the euro area. The important thing is that Germany, the Netherlands, for instance, and um, one or two other uh, member states of, of the Eurozone, they have enough fiscal space that can expand and be the locomotive um, and, and uh, stop a, an imminent recession or a, 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 a slowdown in the euro area. Okay, okay um, thank you very much. For
for uh, Governor Stenaras for a very informative talk. I'm very glad to see you here. Yes, Grigori. Uh, I apologize. I was a little late. The traffic from New York is <laughs> unbelievable. Why don't you identify yourself? Uh, <laughs> so I'm the proud father of a Yale student here. My name is Gregory Prastagos. And uh, I know Governor Stenaras for many, many years. So thank you for your informative talk. And thank you for your leadership during these years of crisis. Because all of us who were outside, <coughs> We know how much wisdom and guts it takes, you know, what you did. Um, we are, I think the general sentiment is that the, the sentiment in Greece has changed. There's huge optimism. We see a lot of things happening um, very quickly. Uh, I would say uh, when I saw the strategic plan of the government, I couldn't believe it because this is, I'm used to these things at the corporate level, and I saw it at the government level. Um, but you refer to the clouds, there are some clouds, you know, and um, there was a question earlier about Germany and um, people talk about Brexit and there's issues uh, generally about a slowdown and a gap of the European uh, innovation and economy. So what would be some quick steps to increase the resilience of this, you know, newly born and very optimistic prospect that we have created in Greece? What would you suggest are some quick steps to take? Um, I think um, the liberalization of the legislation um, governing foreign direct investment is very important. Um, then the liberalization of, uh, of the networks of, um, of domestic markets in Greece uh, should continue. Uh, but uh, I, I think the, the most important, the, the, most import the, the catalyst will be um, for instance, land use legislation to attract foreign, 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 foreign direct investment, all the impediments um, to foreign direct investment, the, the revival of projects that had stalled, uh, they are very, very, very important. Uh, so um, the international community expects the new government uh, to do some, a, a, a number of quick wins in the beginning. But uh, what, what I said, uh, the, the, the there's a three-pronged three strategy. First of all, um, continue to, to respect fiscal targets, but at the same time negotiating a reduction of the primary surplus target. Second, a systemic solution uh, for non-performing loans. And third, of course, uh, what we said now, um, structural reform, uh, all those I mean, I, I would advise uh, the new development minister to do, to do what, one thing, to take the doing business report of the World Bank, okay, and see line by line why we are so low in the ranking and uh, just uh, correct all these, all these impediments and be, be sure that uh, in a few months um, there, there, there's, there's going to be a huge upgrade. Uh, thank you very much for, for a very interesting talk. Uh, you said that uh, the estimate of uh, net capital is about 620 billion. Uh, yes. So, so this implies a capital outlook ratio of four. So on the basis of this calculation, we need uh, 200 billion uh, euro investment to recover the loss. How is that going to happen? I mean, we want it, but how is it going to happen? Um, what I said is that uh, in order to, to be realistic, uh, we, know, uh, we don't need uh, um, to uh, increase investment by 10% a year. If we keep out residential investment and uh, just put emphasis only on, uh, on industrial investment, then we, we need an increase of 5% a year. Um, that should, should come mostly through... 5% No, no, no. 5% a year growth. You need 5%, 5% growth a year in order to restore uh, the business capital uh, we, we had um, uh, pre-crisis. So we said that this is not, this is not impossible. 
that's, uh, um, this is not impossible. But of course, um, you need both um, domestic investment, but mostly you need, we need foreign, foreign direct investment for one simple, simple reason. Now we save about 10% uh, of GDP. Um, and investment is about 12% of GDP, total investment. Um, to increase, uh, to double the investment ratio, okay, um, we cannot do it through, through borrowing because uh, the current account will explode again, as it did in the past. Um, so we, we need foreign direct investment to, to cover this gap. And this is why um, uh, the new government very correctly um, has put the, the, uh, uh, the attraction of private um, uh, direct investment as a number one priority. Uh, that's the... Uh... Then, and for the, for the domestic investment, uh, we need to reduce NPLs and uh, reduce the financing cost of companies in order to, to, to make the domestic investment um, lively again. Okay, we have two more questions. The young lady here in the middle and then you back there. And I think Costas had asked for, oh, for, for Costa, or no? Yeah. It's Arcotera. <laughs> so you spoke about encouraging foreign investment, but I had a rather specific question. In terms of Greeks abroad that want to open a bank account in Greece, because sorry, I can't. Can, can you Greeks abroad who want to open a bank account in Greece? Because domestic residents, all they need is like their tax returns, but there don't seem to be clear regulations for Greek citizens abroad for what a bank has to ask for. So is there a way to sort of amend the regulations or clarify what a citizen abroad would need or to just need their tax return or something like that? If, if I understood well, you asked about uh, the, um, how, how can, can you open a bank account in Greece? No, it's, there don't seem to be clear regulations. Domestic citizens, there's a clear set of regulations, but for abroad Greek citizens, there don't seem to be clear regulations. And I was wondering, is that sort of, are there, is Sorry, there a way to make those I cannot people? hear. Is that, can you? Okay. Yeah, so if you're a domestic Greek citizen, there's clear regulations for what you need to go to a bank and do whatever you need to do. To, to go to a bank in Greece. In Greece. And so if you're and living if, abroad? If you're living abroad, there don't seem to be clear regulations for Greeks abroad. To okay. go to what bank? A to Greek go to Gre in Greece. Go back to Greece. Yeah, and open an account to spend locally or whatever. But there don't there aren't clear regulations. So I'm asking, is there a way to amend that or? Um, Greece is a uh, member of the uh, of the European Community, so um, it, its banks fo follow the same rules as those applied in, in the European Community. So there, there's a uniform um, uh, there, there are uniform rules in the euro area um, uh, which determine um, how. Um, you open bank accounts. I mean, there is, of course, there, there is regulation, the anti-money laundering reg regulation, which um, banks take some, some uh, say, precaution when they, they open a bank account. Uh, but there is no difference. I mean, there is, uh, uh, we don't, uh, um, I mean, uh, we don't treat differently citizens from, uh, from other countries. Just every, if, if I understood well your, your question. Let's move to the last, if you think That's, so. The, the great need for confidence in the Greek economy and the financial structures in order to generate investment for and domestic. Where, how is, has Greece made any progress on the corruption uh, perception index? Last time I saw that, um, we were, Greece was abys abysmally uh, low for a developed country. Um, so that is one query and I think Obviously, addressing that uh, would lead to an upsurge in, in confidence. Um, and to end this on a lighter note, I want to tell my friend John that the pronunciation of my grandmother's village is Vambaku. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> That's uh, why I said that. Um, um, uh, the fact that we are so low in, in all, all these indices um, provides an opportunity if the new government acts quickly 
um, to um, to correct all these uh, um, uh, le le let's say structural imbalances uh, will have um, will 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 see a uh, an upgrade very quickly. I mean, uh, you, you, I, I have quoted uh, certain numbers that show that Greece is very, very low in the ranking in, the, um, in, 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 in all these um, indices of uh, structural competitiveness, including um, how, how quickly the judicial system solves a difference, um, how digitalized the, the economy is, so uh, we have a long way to go, but uh, there is also an opportunity here. Th this is a problem, but, but also a big opportunity. Because if we, go, if we are so low in the ranking, uh, we, we can jump very high by, 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 by changing this quickly. And there is no pol political cost in this. Uh, we, we can implement it very, very, very quickly. So I, I am, this is why I'm optimistic, and I said that uh, I'm an optimist about the, pr the prospects of the Greek economy, because if we concentrate on these rather easy wins, um, we, can, we can change the framework a lot. On that optimistic note, thank you very much.